Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Daniel, and Robert, and April, and everybody who has um, and made this um, invitation possible and, um, and brought me here to Winston-Salem. I'm thrilled to be here and share with you um, Quaker furniture in Philadelphia. And one of the challenges of this presentation is that um, to talk about Quaker uh, furniture made by Quakers, furniture patronized by the Quaker population of Philadelphia, would literally take me hours to, to, to address um, in its entirety. So um, instead, I will be giving you a, a brief um, overview. Um, but suffice it to say that I had a challenge, actually, um, of extricating non-Quakers from this story. Um, and we simply have such a dominance of Quakers in Philadelphia at, um, in its first 100, um, 125 years that um, it is, is simply just the story of Philadelphia furniture. Quakers flock to Penn's woods. Um, it's almost as, as if William Penn um, and Pennsylvania, Penn's woods, um, became the refuge, the escape. Because one thing that we haven't talked about so much is the fact that the Quakers were persecuted. They were not welcome in communities. They were not welcome in Maryland. I was just talking to Sumter and Matt Hobbs um, this morning and talking about the fact that um, the Lloyd family of Maryland, they were Quakers, came to Virginia, had to leave because they wouldn't say the Apostles' Creed. So these were persecuted people who came to Philadelphia looking to create um, a, um, a green country town, as William Penn um, described it. And so they created networks of trade, um, and furniture and woodworking was at its core. Now, I'm really of the belief that to study American art, um, and certainly to study Philadelphia, um, is to study the Atlantic world. So when we talk about these Quakers working in Philadelphia, they really are members of an Atlantic trade network, a ne trade network with other Quakers in, um, in Newport, in Jamaica, in Northeastern North Carolina, um, in Virginia, I'm certain. So there is there's a very large, um, large network of Quakers, and certainly by the end of the 18th century with this area, Piedmont, North Carolina. So I put together this slide um, of dressing tables because we will be looking at each of these dressing tables, but it really does give you an overview of the development of a fabulous, um, a fabulous form. And, um, and remembering that the Quakers who came to Philadelphia came from different cultures. So they were Scottish, they were Irish, they were Welsh, English, German, my own ancestors um, were Germans, um, German Quakers, the Rittenhouses who came to Philadelphia. So they're bringing with them their different, um, their different Quaker cultural roots to Philadelphia and creating a, um, a visual language. So what does it mean to be Quaker? I wanted to just spend a couple minutes on this um, and talk about what it means to be Quaker in colonial America, in Philadelphia, and can we recognize Quaker furniture? Um, in Philadelphia, it's again something that just becomes the, the language, the visual language of Philadelphia furniture is Quaker furniture. Um, and through assimilation, um, that's how it happens. But when you are Quaker, what they were looking to, and what they were really disdaining, was vanity. And I hope you can see that I have highlighted in red the word vain in each of these principles. So they're looking for light and truth, and they're eschewing vanity. So that's what, that's what they reject. Their transgressions um, were both in material, um, could be material, but they could also were certainly in their behavior. Um, now one thing, I. It is Lent um, for many of us, and um, I went to an Ash Wednesday service, and listening to the liturgy of the Ash Wednesday service is actually taken, it seems, from the Quaker faith. And interesting that the Book of Common Prayer for Episcopalians was written in Philadelphia in 1789. And in Lent, Christians who are separated from the body of the faithful were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored to the fellowship of the church. And the Quakers are constantly working through that. And I will be showing you slides um, of these Quakers who, as, um, as we say in Philadelphia, lapsed. And they're either welcomed back into meeting or they leave the meeting entirely. 
So plainness, as we see here, um, is considered the plainness and simplicity, which the gospel, um, can you read that? Um, and it mentions furniture um, just in that first line where I have the, the arrow. So plainness is part of, um, it is mentioned in the book of discipline. Um, Quakers attended their meetings. This is the Arch Street meeting. Um, and this is also the Burlington meeting. Important to understand that Burlington, um, New Jersey, West New Jersey, was part of the original land grant um, that, that Penn um, received. Here you see that the, um, they, the friends are always extolling the virtues of attending meeting. Um, and here they are um, condemning somebody for his conduct and um, inviting him to come and accept, or as Gary Albert said this morning, you have to, the Quakers want you to own your behavior. So they're encouraging you to accept. Um, and they're looking for discipline and truth. Now, it's interesting that I found this um, reference in the Pennsylvania Gazette in 1750, where um, they're looking for somebody who uh, has, has, has run away, and they're saying that the man pretends to be a Quaker, which is really interesting. So he's not a Quaker, but he's pretending to be a Quaker. Now, along that same line, um, we talked yesterday about the fact um, that, about the fact that um, the Quakers lost control of Eastern North Carolina because they would not take an oath and therefore they could not hold a political office. Well, this is 1790 Pennsylvania packet and there was legislation on the importation um, of um, distilled spirits actually. But there was a local respect for the religious nuances of the Quakers and they were allowed to affirm instead of take an oath. So you find a, a local acceptance of this. And so they, they maintain their political control. So in many ways, um, the, um, the, the main sort of core is living in the world and not of it, is plainness. And it's almost as if um, it, they, their outward being, so their apparel, their speech, their outward being was um, a symbol of their inward spirit. It's sort of like a wedding ring in some liturgies. They talk about it as an outward symbol of an inward commitment. And so what the Quakers showed on the outside in their speech, in their apparel, in their buildings, in their furniture was a, was a showing of what their inward piece was. So we're going to start talking about um, the furniture of um, Penn. Um, and Penn reported, he were, in 1685, he reported back that there were 357 houses in Philadelphia, most sorts of useful tradesmen as carpenters, joiners, and turners. So he's already showing, actually, the, the amount of woodworkers that are in Philadelphia when he reports on the success of his settlement um, in between the Delaware and the Schuylkill Rivers. And certainly, they, um, they really show to dominate. Now, the earliest piece of Philadelphia furniture is, um, I'll say fortunately, but a little bit unfortunately, if you're me, um, at Colonial Williamsburg. So um, a little jealousy there. Um, and Edward Evans, who was a ship joiner, made this fall front um, secretary um, or um, escritoire. Uh, and um, here you see his name emblazoned there. Now, as we've been talking about throughout the conference, there was a considerable network, a considerable network of, um, of Quakers, and Edward Evans is one of those early Quakers who spawns, if you will, numerous generations, um, and many of them in the trades. One of the early Philadelphia um, cabinet makers who's also a Quaker is a man named Charles Plumley. Um, and his family had their house along the Neshaminy Creek, and I'm showing the arrow there. Um, you see the part of West New Jersey at the bottom of the map. The Neshaminy Creek is in, current, uh, is in Bucks County, so they attended the Middletown meeting there. Charles Plumley died in 1708. Um, he was born in England, as you see. Don't you love his wife's name? Rose Bud. I love that. Um, they're married at the Middletown meeting in Bucks County. Um, and he dies in Philadelphia in 1708. And his, uh, his inventory is one of those great documents that shows what a cabinet maker, what a joiner, as he called himself, had in his shop at the height of his career, because I don't think he was expecting um, to die, uh, what, 13 years after he um, had. So here are some of the pieces that um, I just 
pulled some of the, um, uh, uh, the inventory items that would be interesting to this crowd. You see here, of course, at the bottom there, 22 hollows and rounds, numerous chisels and planes and all sorts of um, uh, nine OGs and six collections and a pair of astragals, I believe that is. Oil stones, beeswax, um, lots of different hardware, even dovetails. Um, so a, a really a large variety. But what is exciting for people like me too is also the amount of wood that he had. He has considerably more walnut than he does mahogany, um, but uh, Regardless, he has mahogany there. He also has two black carved chair frames, six carved maple frames not finished. So he's working on those. These are not imported. He's working on those. Um, he also has a parcel of olive wood and other veneers, other veneers. So um, that, I should tell you too, that that is um, printed in its entirety in Benno Foreman's book of early um, seven, of 17th century seated furniture. We don't have anything that is known to have been made by Charles Plumley, but um, we do have works that were made by contemporaries of his, and this one is a chest of drawers made by William Beeks. This is actually for sale. Um, it is available. Um, a recent literature graduate, Jackie Killian, did great work on William Beeks um, and their New Jersey and Philadelphia connection. You can see it's signed here. This one has replaced feet, but based on one that is, has original feet, and um, you can see here also the wedge tenons, which become um, a mark of certain Quaker cabinet makers. And I say certain because, again, they're coming from a lot of traditions. They bring with them a lot of different experiences. And there are there's just absolutely sort of no, no rules um, in, in this. But you can see the wedges right here. Yesterday, Ben Hobbs said to us, um, quote, wedges are your friends. Um, so they make that dovetail much tighter. John Head is another Quaker cabinet maker, and um, certainly Jay Stiefel, Chris Storb, Alan Anderson have done great work on John Head. This is the Philadelphia Museum of Art's high chest and dressing table that was um, paid for by Casper Wistar in June of um, June 14th, actually, 1726, to celebrate the, the marriage um, or as part of his marriage furniture with Catherine Johansson or Catherine Johnson. So 1726, John Head. He, of course, had come from Leeds. He was um, a prominent Quaker cabinet maker um, and extremely prolific, and his work is also prolific. A lot in mahogany, um, not in veneers. This is, this is walnut, um, um, but it's not veneered, and he also has a whole group of cherry furniture. So he's working in both the imported wood, but primarily in local um, walnut and, um, and a considerable amount of cherry as well. He's also concerned, um, he dies in, six, in 1754, but in, uh, he leaves his field in 1747, and he is concerned with keeping his family as Quakers. And you see here that he is from, um, getting acceptance for his grandson. Now, Wendy Cooper did amazing work um, for Paint, Pattern, and People on this um, commission. Uh, James Bartram, cabinet maker, the brother, um, actually, of John, uh, John Barton. Uh, the um, the uh, botanist and Peter Calm actually wrote that um, that Bartram is everything: a carpenter, farmer, joiner, turner, shoemaker, gardener, minister. I don't know what else. A brilliant fellow, a mighty exact observer, but a lazy writer. <laughs> so Calm, of course, being a, a, a very energetic writer. Um, so this is a dressing table um, that was made in 1724, and I don't. It's very difficult to see, but it's dated here. It's here is his E.M. for Elizabeth Maris, who James Bartram ended up marrying a year later, and the date 1724 is here. Now, very possible, very possible that the veneers in Charles Plumley's um, inventory were this type of veneer that would have been used for inlay, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that from Lisa Minardi. Um, after they are married, um, James Bartram also makes this wonderful table. Um, and is dated 1725, Bartram, there you see John and Elizabeth. Now Jonathan Dickinson is an interesting um, study um, as a, um, a Quaker patron. He was from Jamaica, he's a merchant, and he was on his way to Philadelphia to, to this haven of, of Quakerdom, if you will, and his boat runs aground. Anybody ever been to Jupiter Island, um, Florida? I was actually there last week. 
Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful place to take a vacation in 2017. Not very friendly. In 1696, when his boat runs aground, he somehow makes it um, to Philadelphia the next year. In um, May of 1697, he dies in 1722. And this is, these are elements from his, um, picked out from his inventory. Um, I'm going to be publishing this because I just think it's the most interesting inventory and it's just voluminous. But you can see mahogany chest of drawers, six foot table of mahogany, four foot table. He has a, an incredible, incredible mahogany. Um, um, inventory here. Cane couch and squab down below, blue silk squab. So this is a man who is, is extremely Quaker. He is the scion of the great Dickinson, Quaker Dickinson family in Philadelphia, which um, has a, a huge population of Quakers throughout the 18th century, prominent Quakers who lead very um, lives that are, are part of the Quaker doctrine. But you can see that his material, his material goods are quite substantial, um, in particular his textiles. Um, here he has two mahogany clothes presses, um, the old broken escritoire with Joseph chains. I assume those are the chains that hold up the, um, the fall front, but um, interesting to hear them called Joseph chains. Inside and outside curtains and veilings and tester claws of red and white calico, those may be for the summertime, and then in the winter, the heritine. And it just goes on and on. That wasn't even the best chamber, right? Um, and then you can see, of course, the biggest is the, his silver. This would be the type of cane chair. Now, typically, these types of chairs are really um, called having come from Boston. Philadelphia is not known for having made so many of them, but Charles Plumley had them in his inventory, and certainly um, they're in the inventory of Jonathan Dickinson. Edward Shippen, I mean, I, in looking for non Quaker cabinet makers, I thought, aha. All the upholsterers, they're the ones who are not Quakers. But in fact, no. Um, Edward Shippen is, of course, brought from Boston as an upholsterer at the behest of William Penn himself in, um, in the 1690s. William Penn call, like, writes to Edward Shippen and brings him down with Thomas Stapleford, who's not a Quaker, other upholsterers. I mean, the, predominantly the upholstery is, um, field is, is non-Quaker, but there are Quaker upholsterers. Getting into the 1730s, Henry Finney made this um, dressing table that's at the Philadelphia Museum of Art in Maple, and he signed the bottom um, of the, uh, uh, the left-hand drawer there. Um, he is not a Quaker, but he trains with a Quaker. His stepfather is a Quaker, and his wife, Hannah Finney, late Brown, is called out for marrying outside the faith. So he dies very soon after they are married. So he may not himself have been that, um, that, prom that uh, committed of a Quaker, but he certainly falls into it. Joseph Armit, another prominent Quaker family uh, who comes um, to us from, um, from uh, ah, Leek. Excuse me. Um, he comes to us from Leek. Um, and he has a connection. I haven't quite figured it out. I've been working on this for years, um, but I haven't quite figured out what his connection is with Newport. But his furniture has very, very close um, visual simulations to Newport cabinet making, especially here, and I apologize for these slides, but in this double chest, um, chest on chest, and you can see that um, there's just a very close cognates in um, Newport. Stop fluting that you see, I know that you see it here and in Winchester as well, um, but there's a connection somehow between Armit and perhaps probably the Quakers in um, Newport. Um, this is a, a fun Quaker family, the Claypools. Um, James Claypool was actually one of William Penn's uh, members of the Free Society of Traders. The Free Society of Traders was basically a club of Quakers who were trying to dominate um, and own all the real estate in Philadelphia um, and they um, to exclude others from acquiring it. That's actually how the area in Philadelphia, Society Hill, that's how it came about because it, those were the properties that were owned by the Free Society of Traders. Free Society, somewhat of an oxymoron. But um, you see um, that James, uh, James Claypool's um, progeny, his family, become cabinet makers. And this is Joseph Claypool announcing in 1738 that he is leaving the business, and he is leaving his tools and such to his son, Josiah Claypool. Josiah Claypool made this high chest. Um, he signed it. 
Um, this is um, mahogany veneer on black cherry on those drawer fronts. Very interesting. Um, and here is the signature up in the um, up here, JOS period Claypool, 1743. But recent research, we feel very strongly that this is Josiah and not Joseph. Um, I showed this because on the bottom here is actually a, um, he has inscribed the pattern for this knee carving, which is very similar to some of the, um, the volutes that um, are on some of the northeastern North Carolina um, furniture that Daniel showed us um, yesterday. Now, I say in Philadelphia, probably not. Josiah Claypool was actually caught stealing silver from his fellow Quaker, Joseph Richardson. He hightailed it out of town and went to Charleston, where his mother was from. And I do believe that this was made in Charleston. Um, George Claypool, his brother, who had already been quite um, assimilated into um, Philadelphia cabinet making, did not receive any of the materials from his father. George Claypool has several um, uh, uh, journeymen, um, I mean, excuse me, apprentices, including um, Jonathan, John Gostolo, Jonathan Gostolo. What you see here, though, is he has adopted carving. He's adopted carving. And you see the, the scallop shell. It is not, um, I, I'm wearing a scallop shell. The scallop shell is, of course, the symbol of, um, of St. James the Apostle. And it is meant to symbolize the human condition, the fi human condition, the physical condition, as well as the spiritual. And you see it all over Philadelphia furniture, excuse me, American furniture of this period. And I do believe that there is some religious connection there, as well as just a decorative connection. I went to the North Carolina Museum of Art when I arrived here on Wednesday, and I saw the Venetian exhibition there, and you see all of the, um, the um, religious, you know, the, the paintings of the saints in niches with the shell above. So there is, a, there is a, a connection there. But here, George Claypool, he is signed. This is actually was being sold at Sotheby's, and I was examining this with a colleague of mine, Jim Gerget, and um, look, pulled out the shell drawer, and on the bottom it said George Claypool, 1748. It was estimated at 80 to 100. It sold for 250. So there you have it. Um, this does have Quaker locks on it, um, so-called Quaker locks. They're just spring locks. I happened to, to take a photograph of this one because it hadn't busted out. And most of them, as you know, have busted out. Um, and they're just um, a spring lock, which I don't think is really a major connection to Quakers. Jonathan Gostolo, again, his um, apprentice. Jonathan Gostolo, not Swedish, born in England. Born in England. That's some new research that I have undertaken on Gostolo um, for the catalog that I'm writing for the PMA. James James, another Philadelphia Quaker cabinet maker who is not well known, um, but an extremely prominent Quaker maker, Quaker cabinet maker, joiner, um, and he made this set of chairs for um, Samuel Morris, as you see here. Um, not only this set of chairs, but this long list of furniture, which you see here in April. Um, the, the, the walnut compass chairs carved. James James um, had apprentices. You see him here um, advertising for his apprentice um, who has run away. Um, but he also takes on his nephew. He takes on his nephew, Edward James, who has some issues um, with the Quakers, um, and he's called to task for them. Um, and here is his, um, his certificate um, then where he is actually called out of this city cabinet maker. We love to see that. Um, and he is finally um, brought back into meeting. James J, I mean, excuse me, Edward James made this, uh, the case for this tall case clock. The movement is by William Houston, and he has signed and, um, and inscribed this. This, um, when I first came to the museum, I took it off view to the horrors of, of some because it's such a, a stalwart within our collection. But I had noticed, and it's difficult to see on this slide, and I apologize for that, but there's boom, boom, boom. The carving has actually been removed from, um, from those spandrels. So um, still, I'm still debating whether or not I'm going to put it, you know, have some put back. It would be, of course, completely conjectural, the design, so it's a tough, tough call. But Edward James worked in um, what they would say in London, Southwark, but being Philadelphia, we say Southwark. So south of, um, of Philadelphia, really, and he made this, this tea table. 
Um, you will notice, I will say, that he this is not the most sophisticated looking label. It is actually by a man named John Norman, who advertised um, that he was an architect and landscape engraver from London who neatly um, engraved shop bills, bills of lading, bills of parcels, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not that sophisticated of, um, of a label. Another tea table, which is, I have not examined this, so um, I have the grid on the back, but he also has, um, you can see these, um, these brands, boom, boom, right there. So as um, we talked, this is um, Southwark in Philadelphia, but there's this sort of crescent of population that begins in Philadelphia. Francis Trumbull is another Quaker cabinet maker. Um, I'm not going to go too deeply into him. He's mainly known um, for as Windsor chair maker, but he also makes much more formal furniture. And he is the apprentice, uh, the master for so many cabinet makers that, that, um, that whose work we see in the 1770s and 1780s. He's somewhat of, the, of a nexus. He's somewhat at, at the nexus of Philadelphia um, and certainly Philadelphia Quakers. Um, as far as patrons, this is um, one of the great, I had to include one of the great Philadelphia um, um, armchairs with the, the compass seats. And this one was owned by Isaac Norris, who you see here called out in the Quaker records. And as Robert said yesterday, thank God for Ancestry.com because we can search these records um, with, with so, so easily. So we learn so much more. John Elliott, um, a, a prominent Philadelphia Quaker maker, and this is his work when he was in Leicester. Um, England. Um, this was acquired by um, by Colonial Williamsburg a number of years ago. And when he was in Leicester, his label, which is on this, um, actually says that he hangs the new fashion spring bells. And when he comes to Philadelphia, his uh, his advertisement includes that. It includes that he hangs the new fashion spring bells. He's primarily known. Um, many people know him for his looking glass, um, both production and sale probably of imported wares, his label being in German um, and, or in English and in German. But he's also well known um, for being, as I said, a cabinet and chair maker who made, um, among such things, made this, um, the set of stools at Wintertour. Had to mention William Savory um, because I know so many people are interested in his work. He's among the, those Quakers who really uh, has the plainer furniture, much plainer furniture. He trains with Solomon Fussell, um, and they basically produce an assembly line method of making seating furniture. This is a tea table that's at the Philadelphia Museums, um, in the Philadelphia Museums collection. And in researching this for the catalog of the American Furniture Collection at the PMA, um, I spent many hours and put our conservation department um, into a tizzy about the label. So many labels of um, William Savory's are, are not original, um, but we did determine that the label on this is original, so we feel confident that this is um, a product of William Savory's shop. And of course, he's known for his so-called Savory chairs. I apologize that this is blurry. Um, and um, this one at Winter Tour. Um, and he was, of course, a good friend of um, Benjamin Franklin's, and he works on 2nd Street from 1742 till he dies in 1787. David Kinsey is a, a Quaker cabinet maker that many of you may not have heard of, but he did make this um, high chest of drawers um, that's in the Philadelphia Museum's collection. It, um, this is a pre-conservation photograph. It is not completed conservation. And give me two more months and I'll have a, um, a post-conservation image of this. But it looks very much to be out of the Clifton Carteret School. Um, but it is signed by David Kinsey and Samuel Appleton. Um, Samuel Appleton is not a Quaker. I believe that he was an apprentice to David Kinsey. That's the signature on the bottom. But David Kinsey comes from an uh, early Quaker family. Um, this is actually his father, who's mentioned up here in 1682. David Kinsey is father. Um, and then you see references to Kinsey, most particularly David Kinsey, who's living for a time at Henry Clifton's. James Gillingham, um, speaking of Clifton, um, is another cabinet maker. So we're getting into the, this, this period of the 1750s, 1760s, which is really the most fertile, fervent period of furniture production in Philadelphia. Um, James Gillingham, who um, kept unprofitable company and unnecessary frequenting of taverns and falsifying promises, and John Elliott and Nicholas Wong, 
We're dispatched. We've heard about John Elliott. We're going to hear a little bit more about Nicholas Wallen at the very end. But they were dispatched to, to treat him um, for that. James Gillingham, this is an um, old picture um, of one of his labels. And here's the chair. And this is a, a type. And this is called in today's marketplace in particular a Gillingham type, a Gillingham type chair. Um, that one is labeled. This one is also labeled. You see that here. And then these are chairs, one from Winter Tour, one from the Philadelphia Museum of Arts collection, where you see he, he has a different style here. His knee box, his legs are so nice and, and thin, sinuous legs going up. And when you don't, you don't have that, that sort of bump, bump out for the knee block, it's this one curve there. And then the curves on um, his front rails. Um, and he also has that splat. He doesn't do the Philadelphia the typical vase um, urn splat that we see in Philadelphia. He adopts this, um, this splat. He also um, makes tea tables. This is his bill to Zebulon Randolph, and here is tea table made by, um, by James Gillingham. He's partners with Henry Clifton, and this is, of course, the, um, Colonial Williamsburg's great Clifton and Carteret um, high chest um, that was signed by Henry Clifton and um, Thomas Carteret. Thomas Carteret, not a Quaker. Henry Clifton, um, a, a, a fervent Quaker. Um, these are just details from, um, from that where you see that Philadelphia carving. And, and in the 1740s, I made reference to this as George Claypool, Claypool being an early um, adopting in that with the 1748 chest on chest. But this cadre of cabinet of carvers descend on Philadelphia beginning in the 1740s beginning in the 1740s, and basically they're leaving London because there's simply just not as much to carve there. There isn't as much wood, and, and the interiors are really changing over to painted interiors. They're using, even instead of um, papier-mâché borders, they're using pewter borders in, in London. So these carvers who are trained in France, trained in London, are coming to Philadelphia um, out of the London cabinet-making trade. Just some more details the dovetails I had to include for this crowd, and of course the back. Um, Colonial Williamsburg did also acquire the dressing table um, to, that goes to suit that. A couple years ago, Lee Kino sold, um, was selling this, and I went to go visit him. I said, Lee, there's something written on the back of it. Sure enough, it said Henry Clifton, which helps to, um, to document that this tea table made um, that's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art is also from the Henry Clifton School. So we're seeing that the Quaker cabinet makers are adopting a lot of what is simply the Rococo, the Baroque style with, with heavy Rococo carving. Um, and here you see Henry Clifton showing up in the Quaker records with his family. Um, he and Gillingham train a man named David Evans, who's also a Quaker, who has early, early roots in Philadelphia. And here's um, a card table at the Philadelphia Museum of Art um, made by David Evans. Clifton and Gillingham actually um, part ways in 1768, um, and, but not after, um, oops, hold on, I should go back to this, not after they're actually hired by George Reed and then later by the Franklins to do some carving in their house. And I have a quote, the carpenter came up on a free day and put up some carved work in the parlor. This is Benjamin Franklin to his wife, Deborah, about, um, about Henry Clifton, joiner and cabinet maker. So they're doing, they're doing interior carved work, we know this, um, their shop is at least. Um, oops, sorry. Landing back on Thomas Tuft. So after Clifton and Gillingham part ways in 1768, um, Gillingham actually joins into a partnership with Thomas Tuft, another Quaker cabinet maker, who um, I hope you can see here, he also is part of the Gillingham school um, with that, that design of that knee, really different from what we see Clifton and Carteret. So there are nuances, there are variants coming out of these schools. And here you see Thomas Tuff's label on that dressing table. Jonathan Shoemaker is a, another Quaker cabinet maker who made this chair. Um, for those of you very keen, you'll notice that the tassel is missing. It is in uh, being conserved right now. They made uh, these wonderful drawings, um, Jonathan Shoemaker and his Quaker um, apprentice, Samuel Mickle, make drawings of their furniture and the work that they do. These are at the PMA, and it leads me to believe. It gives me um, leads me to believe that there is um, 
that the reason a price book, a printed price book, shows up in Philadelphia may very well be um, that the Quakers really wanted to regulate the unruliness of the cabinet-making community in Philadelphia. And in 1772, I hope many of you know of this, of this book, which um, I acquired in 2004 as a promised gift with thanks to Alan Miller, um, who led the owner to us very kindly. Um, this is the only printed copy of the cabinet, uh, of, the, of the price book. And we produced it in facsimile, so you can, you can buy it online. And of course, it shows you um, in, in detail um, the, the prices that were charged, that should be charged. So manufacturers suggested retail price in mahogany, walnut, and then the price that was paid to the journeyman. But what it does for us, too, is also give us these, these names. So here's Chinese doors. Um, and here is um, the dentals um, here. I can't really read that, so the fret. But we also see here the above doors without glazing, so it doesn't include the glazing price, and carved work not to exceed 25 shillings. So um, we, it's difficult to know what 25 shillings of carved work look like, but I'm pretty much guaranteed that that is much more than 25 shillings. Um, that desk and bookcase in the PMA's collection um, having been made for um, two Quakers who were married in 1762, uh, Anne Willing and Tench Francis. Um, here you see folding stands and they regulate it. So this would have been helped help to sort of suppress the competition in Philadelphia. And I just can't help but think that there is, the, and of course it ends um, with coffins. Um, Thomas Affleck, we're finally getting to Thomas Affleck. Um, and here is um, actually his, uh, his two weeks meeting in London, the people who signed it to vouch for him as a Quaker. He arrives in 1763, he has two, um, two certificates, one from Aberdeen where he was born and one from London. He was born in Aberdeen, he trained in Ellen, uh, Scotland which, uh, with a man named um, Alexander Rose. And of course, Horner wrote of Affleck that he was the paramount figure in the cabinet and chairmaking craft and was by far the leader of the Philadelphia Chippendale School. And my work on, on Thomas Affleck has been really, um, really exciting because you find at once that Horner throws out these, these zingers. And you, I, you go to research it, you go to research it, you go to research it, and there's always, it's always mostly true. It's always mostly true. So for a man who wrote an entire book on Philadelphia furniture without one footnote, it's really been exciting to, to find those documents. A little bit, you know, hair pulling, but anyway. Um, he arrives in Philadelphia in 1763 and he begins to cultivate clients who are Quakers, cultivate clients who are Scottish. So the Pemberton and Morris family um, sideboard table, he only has one advertisement, 1768, where he advertised that he has moved. He, of course, moves near to his kinsman, John Elmsley, the turner. Um, he makes this high chest. Um, for uh, the Hollingsworth family, the, uh, Levi Hollingsworth from Cecil County, Maryland, pays him, um, has two major, major transactions with him, and um, I believe that this is one of the two high chests um, for him, chair, um, and the sofa. This came to us in 2006. This was actually this one of these men who called me and said, I'm from an old Philadelphia family. And I'm like, uh, yeah, 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 whatever, right? There are a lot of them. And, um, and he says, he starts telling you what page he is on Moon. And Moon is a man who wrote the, the genealogy of the Morris family. And I'm like, okay. So he invites me up to his house to look at his sofa. And he says, I, I'd like to give this to you. And okay, so we, we bring it down. The sofa is always really nerve wracking because you don't know whether it's married. And nah, 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 nah. it's very nerve wracking. We spent all this money to go up and get it. And it brought down. And our, um, our, our seamstress, our upholsterer, Beth Paolini, started taking it off. And she said, I think you're going to want to come see this. And we, there was this hideous cover on it. And underneath, how Quaker, the original upholstery. So not only that, um, you can see very, very vaguely um, here. Mr. Hollingsworth. Ah, yes. Thank you very much. So there's the original Maureen, and that's the side of it. So this is, um, I believe, among those works um, coming from the same family, a pair of stools um, that have come from the exact same family. Um, these are in a private collection, and um, a table. This is one table just showing you two views of it. 
So Thomas Affleck's work, very much um, a part of the Philadelphia school. He assimilates to that Philadelphia school very quickly. And what's really interesting about him, though, is um, that I, I really don't think that he was the prime character in Philadelphia until after um, his Cadwallader commission. He became very close friends with a fellow um, Quaker named Robert Smith, who was an architect. Um, Robert Smith, um, also Scottish, an architect, brought him up to Easton, Maryland, um, excuse me, Easton, Pennsylvania, when he was doing work on the courthouse there. And I believe that Thomas Affleck is helping him on the paneling um, of that courthouse. The man who I believe was the prime cabinet maker in Philadelphia when Affleck arrived was this gentleman, Benjamin Randolph, a lapsed Quaker. So becomes um, a mem an Anglican, Church of England, um, an Episcopalian. But um, here he is in a miniature by Charles Wilson Peale. He provided furniture for Charles Wilson Peale. Um, Benjamin Randolph made these chairs for John and Elizabeth Cadwallader's house, which was being built um, on, um, on Third Street. And um, here you see two of the, the sets that were made for this couple. Um, this is a reproduction frame actually carved by Brett Headley, who many of you um, know. And I wanted to throw this in there because there's something that we call in Philadelphia Quakerized. Um, and so that is a reproduction of what we believe the original frames look like. There were five frames um, for this, for the five paintings that Peel made for the Cadwalladers. Uh, two of them were carved by Hercules Courtenay, and three of them were carved by James Reynolds. The PMA owns all five of the originals, but we know that they had been cut off. It's very clear um, that they had been cut off. And in fact, I was able to find the document in 1909 where the owner is written, um, the, the attorney of the owner writes the owner of the paintings and says that the paintings are doing fine, um, but the, the, um, the frames are um, broken and not doing well. They're, of course, white pine, so they're quite brittle. Um, and he replies back, cut them off. So they were all cut off. Um, but Despite that, we still have 60% of the original frame here. So we are embarking on a, um, a three-year-long project where we will be adding bits to the original frames. But um, that's just something to take into account. So Thomas Affleck makes the furniture for John Cadwallader, but he usurps Benjamin Randolph, who we know is the prime cabinet maker in Philadelphia. What happens? Thomas Affleck went to Easton, Pennsylvania, to help Robert Smith with the courthouse. The man who is the basically the county executive of Easton, Pennsylvania, who called, who commissioned the courthouse to be built, is a man named Lewis Gordon. Lewis Gordon has a brother named John Gordon, who is a priest. And his diocese is the Diocese of Talbot County. And he is the, 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 and the, the Lloyd family of Maryland, basically, uh, they own 400,000 contiguous acres in the eastern shore of Maryland, including Talbot County, and he's a very close friend of the Lloyds. He officiates at the Kedwalader's wedding. He, um, he gives the eulogies and, and performs the services at Elizabeth Kedwalader's mother's funeral and father's funeral. Suddenly, when the Kedwalader's go to return to, Pencil to Philadelphia, to go into the house that Lambert, John's brother, has been overseeing the redo of. When they go to Philadelphia to return there, they suddenly hire Thomas Affleck to make their furniture. It's like, boom, Randolph is out, Affleck is in. And what I think has happened is that Thomas Affleck is dating Isabella Gordon, who becomes his wife, and her uncle, John Gordon, recommends to the Cadwalladers to hire Thomas Affleck. So rather than the Cadwallader furniture representing uh, Thomas Affleck being the best cabinet maker in Philadelphia, I actually think that it, in fact, is his watershed moment. It is the moment that makes him the best cabinet maker, the go-to cabinet maker in Philadelphia. He, um, this is the easy chair, the museum's easy chair, the museum's card table, one of two, um, that's on that receipt from Thomas Affleck. Um, one of four uh, fire screens, um, and here you see at Easton, Mr. Thomas Affleck of Philadelphia to Miss Gordon. So he's obviously gone up to Easton to be married to her. Now he is written out of meeting 
fear not. He is definitely written out of meeting, and we'll see a little bit of what happens there more. Um, he also does, um, through her, inherit a slave. Um, he, that slave is not um, on his inventory when he dies in 1795, so we don't know what happened to him, but he did inherit a slave. No documentation that he, um, that he what, what happened to that slave, however. Another really close friend of his, Mears Fisher. Um, this chair, really similar to the one um, by Samuel Black, which I saw yesterday, um, coming from, directly from Chippendale, but this is Thomas Affleck, and I include this, which is just a recently taken x-ray, where you can see um, the, the mortise right there, some air there, and the other, here's the double tenon going into the shoe, and look at that mortise cut out. Um, ben mentioned that, you don't care what your mortise looks like. Another, um, another Quaker, um, oopsie, a Quaker patron and Quaker um, cabinet maker, um, Thomas Affleck, making the Dickinson chairs for John Dickinson. John Dickinson actually grew up next door to Elizabeth Lloyd Cadwallader, introduced Elizabeth Lloyd to John Cadwallader. He's from Maryland. He lives in Delaware, which is, of course, the lower three counties of Pennsylvania until June 15, 1776, and he works in Philadelphia. He so believes in the abolition of slavery that when it's not included in the Constitution, he returns to his plantation in Delaware and manumits 137 slaves. So a good guy. Um, the John Penn chairs. So these are two chairs um, at the PMA. We went into, or I embarked on the reupholstery of these chairs and had this overnight um, idea of having this redone. Um, so we took a very close-up picture of this. Um, this is Lady Juliana Penn, and a portrait by Arthur Devis. And then we had it dyed to match the evidence that was on there, a worsted wool damask with a proper width and repeat. And here you see the chair completed. So Thomas Affleck making a quintessential London form. As well, these sofas, which came from Cliveden, Tom, um, Benjamin Chu, the private attorney of the Penn family. There's a detail of it. Again, very much a London vocabulary. And of course, Colonial Williamsburg's, um, uh, another point of jealousy here, um, uh, Colonial Williamsburg's Great Chest on Chest by Thomas Affleck, made for the Deschler family. Um, and here you see a detail just of that wood. I couldn't help but keep include that. And um, a detail of the carving. Neat. This man was, I mean, precise, absolutely precise. This thing looks like it was barely, barely used. Um, all of the drawer, uh, drawer bottoms are side to side. Um, we'll see here. Now, famously in 1777, he is um, exiled um, from Philadelphia um, among those who are sent to Winchester. Apparently stays at the Isaac Brown house. Here's a photograph of this. I was just speaking to the Hutchinsons about this, trying to figure out where um, they were. Um, this is the Isaac Brown house up on Apple, the, what's today Apple Pie Ridge Road. Um, the Quaker, um, that possibly is it, where the Quakers were in exile. But I did go on a very long rabbit's uh, or chase around um, Winchester looking for this. But suffice it to say, it's near the Quaker burial ground on Apple Pie Ridge Road, the house where they were. Now, he has a friend in Philadelphia, Elizabeth Drinker, who is helping Thomas Affleck get home from Winchester. And that is because his wife is not doing well. She's very ill. So Elizabeth Drinker is helping him um, come home. She's also having her things, uh, her furniture, because she wouldn't participate, um, taken from her house. And this is an installation I put together a number of years ago showing what that furniture, you know, putting together what that, the amount of the volume of furniture that that would have been. He's friends in Philadelphia, he returns, his wife does actually die, but he's very close friends with Robert Bell, who's a, a, a London um, bookseller. So he has access to the best, um, to the best uh, designs through him. He is hired by the, by, the, um, by the young United States to furnish this building, which is the House of Representatives on the lower floor and the Senate, the upper body, right, on the upper floor. Um, and here actually is his um, Thomas F. Like chair for the speaker. This is just his speaker chair. Um, and this is um, one of the House of Representatives, the Senate being upholstered in red. He is disowned 
you see that he is disowned. Thomas Affleck, he was disowned because he married out of meeting by a hireling priest. Um, but the Quakers being accepting and, and recognizing one can, um, can, fall, um, can fall off and then come back. Um, he remains a Quaker and he is a Quaker when he dies and he is buried in the Quaker burial ground in 1795. He has a significant inventory, including um, a, a, a one family picture, which I would have loved to have seen, um, as well as uh, 5,443 5, feet of mahogany and six benches, six benches in his shop. So his shop is, is moving right along. His shop is moving right along. So that's about 18 if there are three um, cabinet makers per. Now, I really wanted to make sure that we understood that Philadelphia is not as over overdone as um, as uh, there are other places. So this is Gunston Hall, and of course in Charleston, the Miles Bruton House, a much more exuberant Philadelphia Rococo. So Philadelphia, as as formal as it can be, it's not that formal. Robert Moore, a cabinet, a Quaker cabinet maker in Philadelphia, is entrepreneurial. Goes to Baltimore in seventeen. Um, 71, and here he is remaining in close touch with his um, the people who worked with him in Philadelphia, Nicholas Bernard Carver. The Mifflins, very famous fam Philadelphia Quaker family, and that's um, Sarah Morris. He's up in Boston rabble-rousing for the revolution. He hires John Singleton Copley. The paintings curator at the museum calls this Quaker, um, Quaker is ah, uh, passive-aggressive Quakerism. Um, that's because this is a very large canvas. So while they are plain, it's a very large canvas. They're plain, but it's silk, right? So um, here you see them announcing their intentions for marriage. The Powell family, um, you see here Samuel Powell, who goes on a trip to, to Europe, returns, marries his wife. Um, he remains um, a lapsed Quaker, and he attends Church of England. She remains a Quaker. They build this, or they don't build it, actually, they redo this house, and here you see the interior. They don't, however, include myths. The Cadwalladers, who were also lapsed Quakers, included myths in the carvings in their house. They would not. They included Aesop's fables, and here we finally get to the Fox and Grapes high chest and dressing table, which was separated when it was sold in 1784, and we have no provenance on this piece, on the, this pairing. Um, what we do have is, what is it telling us? What is the fact that there's an Aesop's fable, exceptional carving on it, but what, it, what does it mean that there's an Aesop's fable on the drawer? Who made it? I don't know who made it. Um, the, um, it's not as well as, as precisely made as the Thomas Affleck chest on chest. Um, the drawer bottoms you see here um, run uh, front to back, and um, you see also the dovetails are really, really different. So what does it mean? Remember I said that it was context. It's like, what does it mean to be a Quaker? And this, I believe, is a Quaker, um, a Quaker commission. The, oops, the, um, the, 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 meaning of the fable of the fox and grapes. The fox is reaching for the grapes. He's looking for the grapes. He cannot reach them. He falls and he decries them as sour. However, in the 18th century, they called it ripe. They were not ripe. So it is decrying vanity, decrying greed, a, a really great Quaker message. It's also an Aesop's fable. The Quakers were not allowed to read fiction. They were not allowed to have plays, but they were allowed to read Aesop's fables because they were parables like those in the great book themselves, itself. Okay, so they were allowed to, um, to use them. This is Thomas Johnson's plate 21, where that the design for the fox and grapes is. Now you see that the fox is actually getting the grapes. Where, does it, where do we get the sour thing come in? Well, sometimes it was referred to as sour, but until the 1870s, the fable was about ripeness. And they changed it in the Victorian period because it had a sexual connotation, right? So it not only decried vanity and greed, but it also decried um, taking something before it was ripe, before it was ready. So um, here you see it, of course, on a, um, on a high chest and dressing table, which would have been bedroom furniture. I do believe that these were for a Quaker family. This was something I just found um, in the Philadelphia newspaper in July 1791. As you see here, it says, rot them, they are not ripe. But the title is The Fox and Sour Grapes. So 
So there's, there's something going on here. Interestingly, three months later or two months later in Provenance, the same poem shows up. Um, there's a message coming through in these high chests. I don't know if anybody knows about this one, the Milwaukee Art Museum high chest, where written on the bottom of a drawer, vain youth beware, the trap is nigh, and dangers great in ambush lie, waiting and jaws extended wide, your soul and body to divide. So there's meaning in these things. There is definitely meaning. Um, this is a pair of portraits, 1790, William Clark, little boy holding Aesop's fables. Now, finally, um, the um, Ephraim Haynes and Daniel Trotter. Daniel Trotter from an old Quaker family, and he trains Ephraim Haynes, who marries his daughter. Um, I'm just giving you here the, um, the bill from Ephraim Haynes um, from Stephen Gerard, um, 17, uh, excuse me, 1806. Um, you see here he's uh, in the 11, which is um, November 21st. Um, he orders from him the set of ebony pier tables side chairs, and actually a settee as well. And from Haynes, the Quaker, um, working in ebony, which Gerard has brought, has gotten through his networks, as well as this mahogany pier table with an imported marble top. They are turned by a Quaker named Barney Shumo. Um, it's very interesting that it comes through as Le Shumo in his advertisement from 1813. He dies two years later. Turners being another profession that is just dominated by Quakers. Um, as well as carved by a man named John Morris, who's also a Quaker um, and who also obviously fell astray and his wife um, was looking to, um, to get retribution there. Um, however, by this time, the Quakers begin to really fall off. And um, when uh, Haynes actually pulls out of the cabinet making business to pursue the more lucrative uh, lumber trade, Stephen Gerard hires um, another, the most uh, fashionable cabinet maker at that time, Henry Connolly, a Presbyterian, not a Quaker. Finally, William Wallen, a very lapsed Quaker. So William Wallen is seen here in a miniature um, in 1795-ish uh, period. Um, he is the son of Nicholas Wallen, who we heard earlier who was going to go pursue James Gillingham. Nicholas Wallen was an attorney. He actually won a, a case that he didn't think he should have won, and so he left the, the legal field and um, became the sternest, the strictest Quaker preacher in Philadelphia. His son... Um, is apprenticed to a Quaker merchant, but he sees all the beautiful worldly goods coming in to Philadelphia in the 1790s, and he becomes an extremely lapsed Quaker. He marries out of the faith with his, um, to his uh, partner's sister, Mary Wilcox, and they are opium traders, so um, <laughs> they hire Henry Latrobe, architect Henry Latrobe. Henry Latrobe's mother is Quaker, father Moravian minister trained, born and trained in, in England um, to build this house. And when this was built, there's a legend, a Philadelphia legend, that Nicholas Wong went to the door and wrote in chalk and said, this house shall be sold by the sheriff. Now, of course, it was because the opium trade did go belly up, and it was sold by the sheriff in 1821. So there you have it, after Nicholas Wong had died. But this was, this was basically, we're starting to see that the Quakers have assimilated so much that they become diluted. The, the population becomes diluted, and so many of them begin to, um, to marry out of meeting, so to speak. This is the furniture, of course, that is, um, that is designed um, by Henry Latrobe for the drawing room of um, the, the Wallens house, and that is the subject of the catalog. So where do we end? Joinery, cabinet making in Philadelphia is dominated by Quakers. They produce a style that fit within the discipline Right? I mean, even the high chest, the Philadelphia high chest, high chests go out of fashion in England in 1740s. In the 1740s, a high chest is out of fashion. So the high chest in and of itself is a completely American confection. And it is something that is not at the forefront of style in Britain. It wouldn't be considered the forefront of style. It would be considered this completely strange looking thing. So they are not as, um, they're not really on the forefront of style. They are creating their own style within their discipline. Um, and nuances exist, which is why I did not get too, too much into the, the, um, the particulars of what does Quaker furniture construction look like in Philadelphia. Um, but the sect becomes diluted by the end of the 18th century. And of course, we move into 1827 when there's the, the great separation. 
So um, I will end there, and I thank you for, um, for inviting me and having me here, and I apologize that I've gone over, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them throughout the day. Thank you so much. <laughs>